Hello, everybody, and welcome to the SIG Windows Maintainers Talk. Um, we realize it's the last session of the day, so thank you all for attending, um, and hope you're enjoying KubeCon. Um, a little bit about who we are. My name is Mark Rossetti. I'm a software engineer in Azure. Um, I've been working on Kubernetes since early 2019. Um, currently, I'm in a, a Azure role where I primarily contribute to Kubernetes and Kubernetes-adjacent open source projects. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Arvind. I'm the director of engineering at uh, SoftDrive. I'm also the founding cloud architect there. Um, if you're interested to know what SoftDrive does, it's a small startup based out of Toronto. We make uh, virtual desktop software that doesn't suck, um, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, and we're also hiring. We're looking for a Go programmer to do, uh, write a Go controller for our cloud. Um, and if you want to no, this presentation is actually running on a software VM. All right, so this is our agenda. And some of you might be surprised. Uh, we said we're going to talk about what's new in SIG Windows, but we're starting off with what's old. The reason is Mark and I thought that it's good for us to go through the history of SIG Windows and you know, how we got here, basically. And then we'll transition into you know, what happened in the last year, uh, then move over into contributor spotlights, you know, point you at some additional resources, and hopefully there's some time for Q&A. All right, the history of SIG Windows. So as you know, CNCF and its uh, parent, the Linux Foundation, they have a vendor-neutral approach to all their offerings across the board. So by extension, you should, you know, kind of, you know, you should assume that you can run a Windows server as a Kubernetes worker in your, in your cluster. Uh, but of course, this didn't happen over, overnight. Uh, there was lots of hard work that went in from not only Microsoft, different companies. Uh, Red Hat got involved around 20, you know, late 2019, early 2020. Um, and finally, I think we, uh, Windows Server support as a, as a worker node graduated to stable in 1.14. Uh, so in the Kubernetes timeframe, uh, it's been a long time. It's been almost uh, half a decade now, I guess. Um, so just like how you can use a Windows server as a Kubernetes worker by extension, you should be able to control your cluster using kubectl just like as you do from Linux. So you can run kubectl in your Windows client and do pretty much everything you can do on your you know, Linux client. Um, the only thing that I really want to call out is there's no control plane components that are in Windows. So things like API server, all of that, is Linux only. Um, everything, Windows is just on the worker side. Um, support for Windows is present in all cloud providers, or I, I should say major cloud providers, uh, AWS, Azure GCE. Um, OpenShift is not technically a cloud provider, but one of the major uh, Kubernetes distributions, and that supports uh, Windows too. So how do you kick things off? How do you add a Windows node? Uh, what do you need? There are some prerequisites. You, of course, need a Kubernetes uh, cluster that's you know, up and running with a control plane. We recommend having a Linux worker just to be on the safe side, but it's not a requirement. Um, you then need a Windows Server 2022 or higher. Um, the reason for Windows 2022 and higher, uh, Mark will go into that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, you need admin privileges to this operating system. That's because you're going to do things like add and service which requires admin privileges. And then, of course, you need a container runtime like Containerd. Technically, any runtime that supports Windows will work, um, but most of our testing is with Containerd, so that's what we recommend everybody uses. Um, so once you have your, um, your instance you know, with all these prerequisites in place, you got to configure the node. There's, again, multiple ways of doing this. You can use a combination of Kube ADM and Cluster API. If you're running on an OpenShift cluster, you can use the Windows machine config operator that I worked on in the past. Um, Kubernetes, if you open a PR in Kubernetes, um, you'll run end-to-end -end tests against a Windows cluster. Uh, that cluster is brought up using CAPC, which is um, the cluster API provider for um, Azure. So basically, node configuration depends upon which provider you're using. Um, they will have recommendations on how to configure your node, just you know, our recommendation is also to just follow that. So at the end of this, you have your kubelet up and running. Um, you've got to do some network configuration. Otherwise, you know, it's, 
you're not going to be able to really do anything with the workload that you, uh, which you bring up on your own. Uh, with network configuration, multiple CNIs are supported. Uh, you could use Flannel, Calico, OVN Kubernetes, Azure CNI. This, again, is really dependent on what provider you use. Your provider will recommend a CNI. Just go with that. So the next question many people have is, OK, I have a Windows worker. I'm able to you know, instantiate workloads on it. What do I get? Is it you know, is it an apples-to-apples -apples comparison with Linux, with, uh, Linux? Conceptually, everything works similarly with Windows, but different operating systems, so there will be differences. Um, for example, in, with, a, with a pod, you'll typically indicate that a pod is a Windows pod by using the spec OS name field. Um, you will then have some additional things that you would need to do to uh, allow for scheduling. Uh, multiple ways of doing this, you can use a, a label selector if you want. Uh, you can also taint your node and then have a toleration on your pod for landing on that particular node. Um, and then as you start looking into your pod spec, there are a bunch of fields that will not work uh, with Windows pods. I've put a couple of examples here, um, HostPid, host IPC. they are just a couple. There are a bunch more. Um, same goes for security context. Uh, there is Windows options within security context, which has all the... Uh, security features you can apply to a Windows pod. Uh, things like, of course, SE Linux is not going to work. Uh, when it comes to privileged containers, uh, Linux has that support so that you can uh, do privileged operations that interact with your host using privileged containers. Windows doesn't have a, a clear equivalent of that, but you can achieve the same thing using host process containers. For example, we support all CSI plugins or whatever CSI plugins work that work with Windows. Uh, initially, for getting a plugin to work, you needed to use CSI Proxy, uh, which is a service that runs inside your Windows node. But then if you use a host process container, you don't need to do that either anymore. Um, device plugins are also supported. Other features like horizontal pod auto-scaling, collecting metrics for your pods and containers, all of that is on par with uh, Linux. If you are used to doing kubectl exec to um, debug issues inside your pod, you can do the same thing with uh, Windows pods, except you won't get bash. You'll get command prompt or, or PowerShell, depending upon uh, what the base image you use. So in other words, we strive to keep uh, parity with Linux features that are being added on the worker node side. Um, API compatibility. This is, again, very similar to what I was uh, speaking to previously. We maintain, you know, all APIs are pretty much compatible, but again, different OSs, there will be differences. Uh, take, for example, identity. Uh, Linux uses user IDs and group IDs that are shared between the host and the computer, but Windows uses a, a binary format called uh, secure IDs that are stored in a database called SAM, which stands for, I think, Secure Access Manager. Um, and that's not shared between the host and the container. The same goes for file permissions. Uh, Linux uses bitmask and a combination of UIDs and, and, and GID. You can also apply optional you know, access controls. But Windows, everything is based on access controls, uh, ACLs, which are, again, based on SIDs. Um, so some differences here. Uh, file paths, of course, um, slash versus, you know, backslash versus forward slash. And when you're using uh, the window slash, make sure you quote and then you escape it. Um, otherwise, you're going to run into trouble. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then with, with signals, uh, if you are running a Windows thread, uh, you, can, you, you, know, you can kill it with uh, standard messages like WM close. You can, if you're running a console application, uh, you typically will implement a control handler to handle control Cs. Uh, but the most use, usual use case is if you run a Windows service, you'll want to listen for a service control stop, which is what happens behind the scenes when you do uh, stop service. The other thing which um, everybody trips upon is DNS resolution. DNS resolution is supported for Windows pods, except you have to use the fully qualified name. If you try to use the partially qualified name, like Kubernetes.default, um, that's not going to fly. Um, with that, I want to point you at some documentation. Uh, so some of these differences that I've shown, 
it's not the, the full list. I just highlighted the main things that usually you know, uh, people hit when they start working with Windows pods. For more information, look at Windows and Kubernetes. That gives you the, uh, the full list of uh, compatibility matrix that you can find. Uh, we have also, the community has worked very hard on, ad, on documentation on adding Windows worker nodes. So it's now a one-stop page uh, for doing this. We, this was missing for a while, but you know, this has happened in the last year, and it's, you know, it's made a big difference in the community. So please take a look, and if you find anything, uh, reach out to us on Slack or open an issue. With that, I will pass the baton on to Mark. Okay, thanks, Arvind. Um, yep, so now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time uh, going over what we've been working on in SIG Windows. And a lot of these uh, recent kind of changes are um, kind of bringing parity, Windows parity for features that had already been implemented in Node. Um, so we're gonna go over which ones we've added Windows support for and also kind of go a little bit technical about what some of the differences are or um, potentially some gotchas here. Um, the first one that I highlight is now Windows nodes um, as of 131, which was the previously uh, the last, the latest release of Kubernetes, supports memory pressure eviction. Um, this feature is on by default for all of your Windows nodes and um, we do have a default hard eviction threshold of um, the available memory is less than 500 megabytes. So what that means is after um, the node where it starts to report that the memory available um, is less than 500 megabytes, um, it will start the eviction process, which I can go into in a little bit. Um, but this is a big difference between Windows and Linux. I believe Linux nodes, it's um, memory available is less than 100 megabytes. Um, and the difference is really just to account for all of the extra things that Windows does and needs to, uh, needs to keep the node healthy. Um, so at a very high level, this works exactly the same way as on Linux. If you have, um, if you're over committing on memory or if you are, um, have some pods that are, don't have limits set but are maybe misbehaving and using more memory and you start to see a little bit of memory pressure on your node, um, you'll see events get emitted that says this node has some memory pressure. You'll see um, a condition, I believe, memory pressure um, get applied to the node and you'll see the node go unhealthy so new pods don't get scheduled to it. Um, and then in the logs, you'll see an eviction controller start to identify pods that are um, ranked in abusing the amount of memory that they've requested, start evicting those, and then hopefully it will evict those pods and you'll see your node go healthy again and normal operations uh, resume. Um, now the reason why this didn't uh, land at the same time as the Linux one is because of course there's some differences under the hood. And I'll go um, a little bit into detail about what those differences are. Um, anybody who's used to looking at like kubectl top node, um, container, or, or node or pod, or at the stat summary API, you'll see most uh, Kubernetes likes to report working set memory. Um, working set memory is generally, and on Windows, that's the amount of pages of memory that are loaded into your physical memory. Now, on Windows, um, for a number of reasons, uh, including that Windows has uh, virtual memory and paging on by default, a lot of um, Windows likes to operate on commit memory, and this is actually what the container limits, uh, memory limit is based on as well. Um, and commit memory, or your, the amount of commit memory is the amount of pages that any process has requested um, from the operating system via memory allocation operations, whether or not they've been touched, whether or not they're in um, physical memory or swapped to disk. Um, so that is very important to consider. Um, now I believe on Windows Server, by default, uh, virtual memory or paging is enabled and your uh, page file is fixed size. That is important <laughs> for something I'll get to in a minute. On client, um, virtual, page, or virtual memory is also enabled, but uh, Windows has the ability by default to grow and shrink the page size as it sees fit. I think it's just an option that you can turn off, um, but generally you want to leave it on. And I, I will say you can turn virtual memory, or like, yeah, you can turn the page file off on Windows, but everything down to the OS assumes that that's on, so it's generally a very bad idea to do that. Um, so for this memory eviction signal, um, we have a memory available and uh, like a, the capacity and amount of used memory signals here. Uh, for the node's capacity, we base that off of the commit limit, which is uh, just, an, I believe it's the get performance info system call. 
and that will tell you the number of pages of memory that can be allocated before the page table or before the page file needs to be expanded. Um, so, if you are tracking how close your node is to becoming low on memory, depending on if you have uh, dynamic page sizes, you may see that number change. So that is also very important to be aware of, and that's highlighted in the documents below. Um, so next is the amount of memory that your system is using, and that's based off of the commit total um, for the entire node, which is the total amount of uh, pages of memory that have been requested for all processes on the system, kernel mode, user mode, whether they're running in a container or not. Um, so uh, because these are so fundamental to the memory pressure eviction and because this is on by default, um, we have also exposed, starting with 131, now Windows nodes will report the commit limit and the commit total for the system in the stat summary um, endpoint. I do want to call out that track, depending on how your workloads, memory allocations look, the shape of them, it can be very important to monitor the commit memory usage for your individual containers and pods, especially because that is how the uh, memory limits are enforced. We are working on exposing that in the stat summary API as well, and I believe that's tied to the another cap that's being driven by Signode for C advisor list, CRI only stats. Um, so that's a little bit of information there. You can go pretty deep if you want, um, but I do want to call out that if you are over committing on memory, um, for your, just to get better density on your Windows nodes. There are some additional things you want to be aware of. And um, I also want to say that Windows Node Exporter, um, if you install that in your node, that allows you to monitor the commit memory usage for all of your Windows containers, as well as the entire node. Um, so that can hopefully tide you over until we are able to report that in the stats summary endpoint. Um, Yep, this is all live today, and um, we've seen it help just with node stability for a couple of reasons. And if you're interested in configuring this or what all the different knobs you have are um, for the kubelet, there's some documentation here on the kates.io page. Um, the next uh, set of kubelet enhancements or parity features that we're bringing for Windows are um, CPU and memory affinity for your, your pods. Um, so I believe CPU manager, topology manager, memory manager, memory manager have been available in Kubelet for a number of releases. I know memory manager just went to GA. But what this allows you to do is, depending on how everything is set up, it allows you to um, schedule pods to um, either align with different CPUs to get uh, guaranteed access or exclusive access to CPUs, or to try and align your Windows workloads to be co-located with, uh, within like a in proximity to a NUMA node. And um, so this is uh, going to be available in the next release of Kubernetes 132, and um, this did require a cap to go through, so this is behind a feature gate for now. Um, at a very high level, it works the same way as on Linux. If you do opt into using CPU Manager, you can specify the CPU Manager policy, and the two that we support on Windows are none and static. And if you turn it on and use the static CPU policy, you'll get the exact same um, kind of placement behaviors as on Linux. We use the same uh, code for that. In order to utilize this, you do need to schedule guaranteed pods, which, are, which mean that your, the requests and the limits for either CPU or memory are, are equal to each other. And um, what this does is if, if you schedule a guaranteed pod with an integer value of a CPU, you will get um, the CPU manager tells us which CPU to schedule all of the, the processes on, and we'll pass that information down to the container runtime and start that, and you should get, you, you shouldn't see other pods using the same CPUs um, for that. So that can help for really kind of performant dependent workloads. Um, next is memory affinity. Um, this one does behave a little bit differently than, than Linux, but it has, the same, same goals. So on Linux, there is a static and a non memory manager policy where you basically set up, you, the system will query like the topology of the architect, like it'll query the topology of the system and carve off uh, quota in different regions of the, like different regions close to different uh, NUMA nodes and 
schedule, um, like reserve those, and then also assign NUMA nodes to the, like, it'll link up the NUMA nodes and where the processes are running. On Windows, we've introduced a new policy called best effort, which behaves very similar to the static policy, but has a key difference. And the key difference is that on Windows, we can't assign affinity to different NUMA nodes directly um, for, for different processes. So what we have to do is we query the system. We, the memory manager basically tells us what NUMA node to give a, to, to bind to for affinity. And then we will query the operating system to see which CPUs are associated with those NUMA nodes and then schedule those uh, workloads with affinity to those CPUs. Um, yep, this is, um, there's more documentation about how CPU manager, memory manager, and topology manager all work and can uh, play, interact together um, on the Kate's website. And once 132 is live, there'll be additional documentation about the new policies for Windows and how those work. Um, so we're looking for feedback and um, be able to try that out. The next one that I want to call out is uh, the Windows uh, support for graceful node shutdown on Windows. This is another feature that has been around in Kubernetes for Linux for um, several releases. And the idea of this is that um, when a node is uh, initiating a shutdown for whatever reason, on Linux, um, the kubelet places an inhibitor on the systemd service and then um, starts uh, starts a graceful shutdown process for all of the pods on the node. And the intention is that um, in the event of any like planned or unplanned outages that are not fatal to the system, it'll give the workloads enough time to finish up handling whatever requests they're doing and um, shut down gracefully and then have those requests or workloads be moved to other nodes for whatever reason. Um, on Windows, this is um, basically the same behavior. We are able to delay shutdown of the system and then send signals to the pods to shut them uh, so hopefully they shut down gracefully. And, but the uh, difference here is that in order to enable this on Windows, um, it's only supported if you're running the kubelet as a Windows service. Um, I believe the kubelet code for quite a while has had um, the ability to register itself as a Windows service and run as a Windows service, but I realize not everybody does that. Um, there's a number of different service managers like NSSM that people might want to use. And we are investigating how to bring support for this feature to uh, the to Kubelet's not running as a Windows service, but um, for now, that is the limitation here. Um, and yeah, there's, uh, again, once 132 comes out, there will be more documentation about how to configure this and what this means for Windows in on the, the main Kubernetes documentation page. Um, that's most of the feature work we're doing, or we've been doing, um, but I do want to give a couple of ecosystem updates. Um, as Arvin mentioned, we are recommending everybody use Windows Server 2022 at least. Um, and in this past Kubernetes cycle, we have um, dropped Windows Server 2019 testing from all of the test matrix. Um, mainstream support ended in January 2024, and it's hard for us to get licenses to run in CI and everything. And um, just in general, it's better to stay on a more current operating system. So if you're still using Windows Server 2019, uh, please upgrade. Now I also want to um, call out that Windows Server 2025 GA'd um, pretty recently, and we have um, started to, uh, we've, we've done a round of validation of Windows workloads or and the kubelet running on Windows Server 2025. Um, we did have a couple of bug fixes that went in, and I believe were backported several releases for um, just functionality that the kubelet needed that wasn't available or different in Windows Server 2025. Um, so that should be good to go. We are close to having uh, consistent validation on um, test grid for all of this. And um, a feature that I'm super excited about that is new with Windows Server 25, 2025 is this portability for Windows Server containers. Um, historically, if you wanted to run a container in process or a process isolated container, the container image that you were targeting and the host operating system needed to match. You could get around that by using Hyper-V isolated containers, but that's uh, kind of cumbersome to use and Hyper-V isolated containers still aren't fully supported in Kubernetes. Um, with this portability for Windows Server containers, um, 
as long as your uh, container image is Windows Server, based on Windows Server 2022 or later, you can run that image as a process isolated container on Windows Server 2025. Um, this should also help ease the, the process of updating your nodes to Windows Server 2025 because you won't need to rebuild all of your container workloads to target that and do all of that validation. Um, so it's a super awesome feature that came from the Windows team and hopefully a good reason to update. Um, yep, so I think that's a lot of what we've been working on and I wanted to, we wanted to spend some time to recognize a couple of contributors for SIG Windows. Um, the first one is Yuan Liang, who, um, new contributor to SIG Windows and um, basically came to a SIG Windows meeting one time with a PR for a prototype of the delayed support for Windows, or graceful shutdown, graceful node shutdown support for Windows. Um, yeah, I was super involved in the discussions with that. Um, actually authored the KEP and got the alpha implementation landed in the same release, which if anybody's tried contributing to Kubernetes knows isn't always easy, but we're super thankful for them. They kind of brought a lot of energy to the project. Um, another thing that SIG Windows has been working on for quite a while, um, which I didn't call out previously, but is super important, is um, migrating all of the Windows workloads to the community infrastructure. If you saw the keynotes this morning, there was a big call out for that lift and shift effort, and this is a big part of it. Um, and I wanted to thank Ritika, who's here in the audience, for putting in a lot of work uh, in, in that. And a lot of times that work is, goes very underappreciated or unnoticed, uh, but it is super important in open source communities like Kubernetes and CNCF, so thank you. Do you wanna finish it up? Yep. So next we have some additional resources that we want to point you at. Uh, this is again, call for contributors. Um, there's a lot of work to do in SIG windows and not enough resources to go around, so um, a good starting point is the community page that gives you a brief overview of what we do in SIG Windows and how to get started. Um, we have a pretty detailed con contributing guide too. Um, so please take a look at these and reach out to us um, either on the SIG Windows uh, Kubernetes Slack channel or you could join our community meeting. It's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time every Tuesday. Uh, we welcome everybody, anybody to join this meeting. Um, and of course, we are happy to see any new issues open against SIG windows, um, but of course, the thing that we welcome the most are PRs to fix these issues. Um, so, uh, and I do want to call out like a lot of what we've talked about is really specific to SIG node, but we are very fairly horizontal SIG. So if you're yeah. interested in storage, networking, um, just anything, there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, that's to exactly what I experienced working on on Windows while I was at Red Hat is you get to see every aspect of Kubernetes when you work on uh, Windows nodes. It's just not the kubelet. Uh, you'll get to do some storage, you'll get to do some networking. Um, so it's, it's actually a great entry point into the Kubernetes ecosystem. You kind of get a good exposure to you know, the whole shebang that's Kubernetes. So, all right, we have some time for Q&A. Um, if you folks have any questions, uh, we're happy to ask, answer them. Thank you, folks. All right. Um, I think going to the mic. Oh, yeah. okay. We got a mic here. Um, I understand there's some work going on with the networking plumbing to support Istio, uh, like to intercept some of the traffic and all of that. Are you guys familiar with that? And if so, can you give any insight on kind of what the state of that is and when we can expect that to hit? Do you want to go to the mic and yeah. just answer that? I mean, I primarily came here to uh, drive evangelism for EVPF for Windows, and I met this, um, I think, a field team member who was saying he was working on a demo for Istio support on Windows um, to address a four-year-old <laughs> open GitHub issue. So. Uh, I think the answer is we're working on it. <laughs> um, did that answer your question? Or? And I yes. <laughs> do also know that um, I believe Keith Maddox, one of the Istio maintainers, did a prototype slash spike for Istio Ambient on Windows and was able to get Z-Tunnel working and talking to pods. Um, but I th think that it's still a couple of 
I think there's still work to do to, to finalize that, but there is some desire and momentum behind that too. I can't give a timeline on yeah. that though.